You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death, The Nature and Significance of Central Europe and the European Folk Souls. It is 15 lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is the last lecture, Lecture 15, given in Cologne on the 19th of June, 1915, entitled The Overcoming of Death Through Cognitive Insight, Experiences of the Soul Before Birth and After Death. The day before yesterday at the branch in Dusseldorf, we gave consideration to what, in the context of life, one refers to as man's passage through the gate of death. The essential point here is that Western spiritual development gradually evolves toward a knowledge such that death is overcome through cognitive insight, by recognizing it as a transformation of life itself. It is quite natural that in our age, pervaded as it is by materialistic views, death must increasingly appear as a boundary of the world wherein man lives. We can easily imagine that in olden times this was significantly different. It was, of course, different because, as we know, people in these former times still had a kind of remnant of ancient dreamlike clairvoyance. This dreamlike clairvoyance was associated with a state of dwelling in the spiritual world. And in those times our souls were incarnated in bodies that made it possible to live clairvoyantly in the spiritual worlds. Our souls were connected with the spiritual world, thus making death at that time not so significant or final a phenomenon as it is in our times. But this present consciousness would become ever more pronounced if in our time the knowledge made available through spiritual science were not gradually to manifest itself. For one should not think that this spiritual science that we make our own does not have the greatest significance as a spiritual science also for the whole of human experience. To be sure, many of us will say that we are progressing on our path through the spiritual scientific movement in a twofold way. Firstly, by penetrating with our understanding and reasoning powers what spiritual science gives us. Secondly, by applying to our own soul the spiritual scientific methods that are outlined in, for example, the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? We are endeavoring to arrive at a perception of the spiritual world already during our physical incarnation. But there will be many who say that only a very few are enabled, through their karma, to enter the spiritual world in a fully conscious way in this incarnation. It is certainly true that someone might enter it merely by applying these rules, but noticing that one is within it and being attentive to the fact is more difficult than the process of entering it. And there are many who, even though they are within the spiritual world, find it impossible to devote their sensitive, intimate attentiveness to what they experience, so as really to be conscious of their position within it. It could be said that for someone who applies the rules given in the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, it does indeed happen after a relatively short time that as regards his own self, he is within the spiritual world, but he does not notice it. In this regard, it must again and again be emphasized that an intelligent grasp of what is given in spiritual science does not in any way depend on whether one can oneself have insight into the spiritual world. We have often said that presenting the facts of the spiritual world is something that does, of course, require spiritual scientific perception. But if what has been found has been transmitted, anyone can understand it, provided that he applies his healthy intelligence, unobscured by materialistic prejudices, in an open-minded way. 
we must be clear that it is not enough to claim or persuade ourselves that we have gone far beyond the preconceptions manifested by the materialistic age. To be sure, we will have gone far beyond these prejudices in our will and our aspirations if we seriously devote ourselves to the spiritual scientific movement for the fact is that no one will honestly and sincerely ally himself with this spiritual scientific movement who does not have the deepest inner longing to rise above materialistic prejudices. But our habits of thought are influenced so fundamentally by these materialistic prejudices, and especially by what is not directly a materialistic prejudice, but is connected with such a prejudice. It is because of such an underlying materialistic prejudice or preconception that people are in a certain sense unable to develop the capacity to think in an all-embracing way. However much our time is based on reason and logic, there is little evidence in our time of a sharp intelligence and reasoning power among those whose endeavor it is to be at the forefront of the scientific or other cultural aspirations of our present time. People do not in our time strive toward clarity of thinking. If clarity of thinking was something toward which they fully aspired, they would also be able fully to understand spiritual science. Anyone who thinks with full clarity does not find anything to object to in what spiritual science has to say, at any rate in general terms. For the spiritual scientist can err over details, just as anyone else can. Countless examples could be given to show us how little our time is inclined to devote itself to clear, precise thinking. I should like to give you an example from what we are now experiencing. It has again been possible to read of a very familiar judgment on the part of a really great person, someone of considerable importance. This judgment has been repeated, and one of the German publicists has made much of the fact that this judgment has again been put forward. Thus a great person once said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. To many thinkers who think in accordance with our time, this appears to be so infinitely logical. War is a continuation of politics. Of course, nothing should be said against the greatness of the man who expressed this observation. He means to say that nations conduct certain political negotiations between one another, and thereby order their mutual affairs. If these negotiations arrive at a certain point where they cannot, so to speak, be taken any further, what then should happen? Well, war comes in their place. In this way, the judgment of all people can be taken into account and directly acknowledged. But if one gives this a little thought, one comes to see how one-sided this judgment is. For it is, for example, equivalent to saying that there are two individuals who are friends or who have such a relationship with one another that they get on well together and perhaps love one another and that they then start quarreling. One could also say that quarreling is a continuation of love. Viewed outwardly, quarreling is the continuation of love. But one will not have said anything special about the nature of the quarrel if one knows that this quarrel is the continuation of love. One has therefore not achieved anything or said anything even remotely illuminating about the war if one sees it as the continuation of politics. It is indeed the case that judgments in our time may appear hugely meaningful but are nevertheless thoroughly one-sided. Many judgments today are greatly valued that have no particular bearing on the matter at hand. Nevertheless, such a judgment does not necessarily always need to be fruitless, and it can even have a significance of some value. But those who acknowledge the value of our world conception should be able to penetrate the veil of Maya also with regard to outer life. Of course, it is not a question of objecting in the least to the judgment that appears in every other newspaper article, for it certainly has some merit. But one would have some strange inner experiences if one were wanting to examine it with clear thinking. 
Thus one finds today in almost every newspaper article statements such as, We will be victorious because we must be victorious. As said, nothing shall be said against the justice of this statement, against the fruitfulness and worthiness of this statement. But if someone is standing before a river, which he has to cross, says, I will swim because I have to, the correctness of the statement is dependent on whether he can swim. And one can in this case attest with clear thinking as to the correctness of the statement of the non-swimmer. I want to swim across because I must swim across. What kind of value does such a statement have? Well, it has a great value, for it gives forces, it gives courage and confidence, it pervades the will, it is a statement that spurs on the will. It is not a statement that recognizes something but one through which the will is steeled. The statement is thereby significant and important. Do not misunderstand such things. They are put forward in order to show that a clear thinking that penetrates things is something altogether different from what is so often held to be valid. In our time, materialistic habits of thought are extraordinarily great and powerful. However, our judgment is most dulled if we were to become drawn into verifying what the spirit researcher says. It is the case that everything that the spirit researcher says can, even if one has never cast one's eye, E-Y-E, into the spiritual world, be understood if one really applies sound right thinking. There is no one who, even without being clairvoyant, would be obliged to oppose spiritual science if only he has a sound faculty of judgment. To be an opponent of spiritual science signifies that quite other reasons reside in a person's nature, in his soul. One of these is the following. When a human being stands in the physical world with his perceptive faculties, he has the constant availability for this purpose of his physical body, his etheric body, and also his astral body. These the physical body, etheric body, and astral body, have long been involved in the world's evolutionary process through the ages of Saturn, Sun, and Moon, and have been built up within man out of the forces of the divine hierarchies. They are today what they have become in the past. When a human individual enters his physical body, he is placed with what has been prepared for him in the course of long ages. All this supports him when he is engaged in physical perception. Every time that we have a perception and form an idea, an impression is made upon our physical body. We know nothing of this, but this impression indeed happens within the physical body. And that it happens is the reason why we have memory during physical life. One needs, however, to have a right picture of this. If we ask ourselves why we have memory in physical life, we must say that every time that we form an idea or mental picture, an impression is made upon the physical body. This impression is indeed more or less human-like. But every mental picture that we form does not, as someone who thinks in a materialistic or fanciful way may suppose, make an impression only somewhere or other in the brain, but upon the whole human being. Moreover, every such mental picture impresses itself in a manner depending on the nature of the formation of the head and also the upper part of the chest. It is really true that as I am speaking to you now, perhaps a hundred syllables a minute, you will during these minutes have fifty human beings forming themselves within you so that fifty human beings are quickly removed, the one rapidly exchanging places with the other. You can work out for yourself how many such human images will have been formed within you by the time that the hour of the lecture is over. These human images are more or less similar in their outward form, but not entirely so. None is totally like another. Each is different from the others, even though only a little different. As a child might imagine it, one could have the idea that an impression that one is now having of the outer world and which one recalls tomorrow, has taken up residence within one in some form. 
It has not done so, but an image, which is human-like, has remained within one. Indeed, from every impression of the outer world, an image remains, which is human-like. And when you recall the impression again, the following day, you transpose your soul into this human image that is within you. And the reason why you do not see this human image the following day, but recall the impression, is that you are reading in your astral body. It is a right reading activity, an unconscious reading activity. Just as when you write something down and want to read it, you do not describe the letters, but what the letters signify. So is it tomorrow when you recall what you have experienced today. You do not behold the image which arose within you, the human phantom that lives within you, but you interpret it. In your soul you put yourself into this human phantom, and your soul experiences something quite different from this human phantom. It experiences again what it has experienced yesterday. This should come as no surprise, for if today you read Goethe's Faust, what do you have within you? Masses of paper and printer's ink in whatever form. In an outwardly material sense, this is all that Faust is, and you would never have the Faust that Goethe wrote if you were not able to do something with the paper and printer's ink that you have in front of you. If you could not decipher it, it would be nothing but paper and printer's ink. With respect to the outer world, materialists are forever saying that what the spiritual scientist claims to be a reality is nothing of the kind. But these materialists are just as clever as someone who would say, Why do you go on about Goethe's Faust, when it is, after all, nothing but paper and printer's ink? This judgment about Faust is just the same as the judgment that materialists pronounce today about the world. But the same is also true in the case of our memories. Tomorrow nothing will remain in our human nature of today's impression of the phantom, the image, and everything beyond this must be left to the soul's work on this phantom. And just as from the paper and printer's ink the whole structure of Goethe's Faust emerges, So from what has remained within us of the phantom does the re-enlivening of today's impression appear when we recall it tomorrow. But this activity that must be carried out in order that we can remember is brought about by our wonderfully formed physical body and then our etheric body, which have been prepared by the ages of Saturn, Sun and Moon. They accomplish, they do this work for us, and a person who thinks materialistically senses and feels this. Now consider, the spiritual truths that are arrived at are gained without this help, so that the help of the outer physical body is not demanded. In this case, forces that otherwise work in the body must be derived from the inner nature of the soul. The soul must be the source of this activity. When one has a spiritual perception that is not brought about through the outer world, we cannot, when we want to recall it, take ourselves back to an inner phantom that has remained and which is, after all, in the body. We have here to engender everything again from within, without this support, by means of a much stronger power. This, too, is nothing so very surprising. You only have to think of the difference when what I have in mind is reflected on a small scale. Suppose that someone reads a poem today, and this poem that he has read today he still has tomorrow in printed form. Then he can read it again tomorrow and again the day after. But suppose that he does not have a copy of it and must then speak it from memory. You see the difference. The one time we do something which involves no activity on our part. What we would otherwise have to do, the external piece of paper brings from the one time to the other. We have a support in the paper. We have to make more of an effort if we want to reconstruct the poem from our soul, from within. 
that someone who lives in the spiritual world has to make a greater effort with his will than one who depends on the support of his body. But this is connected with the fact that everything that is discovered in spiritual science or is only understood requires a considerable inner effort. One can be far lazier and more lethargic if one is a materialist than if one is a spiritual scientist. This is the reason why people are materialists, or at least one of the reasons. They are not materialists for the reason that they are compelled by some kind of logic. They are materialists through fear and also through lethargy, because they want everything that takes place within the soul not to be enacted through the inner forces of the soul, but rather through what is inscribed and recorded within the body. These are things that we need to be thoroughly aware of if we want to understand the reasons why so many people oppose spiritual science. But it is particularly difficult to embrace with one's thinking capacity something that will and indeed must be arrived at when a person passes through the gate of death. The day before yesterday I referred to what is essential when someone crosses the threshold of death, namely self-knowledge. Now, of course, this self-knowledge is not a simple matter. Some of you will have already heard me speaking about the extent to which people are prone to the greatest errors, even in connection with their outward form. There is a philosopher to whom I have often referred who lived in Vienna. This is Ernst Mach, a serious-minded philosopher. And I am not speaking of the Hamburg mocker of theosophy by the name of Mach. He wrote an title, Analysis of Feelings, where, with great naivete, he says the following, I was walking along the street when I suddenly had to stop, for I met a person of whom I thought, this is someone with a very unpleasant face, indeed with a repugnant face. And then I discovered that I had passed by a shop window, and the reflection was such that I had seen myself. This made me aware how unfamiliar I was with my own form. When he saw himself, he accordingly considered himself to be an unpleasant-looking person with a repugnant face. This is a professor of philosophy, a famous present-day professor. And in order to intensify the point he is making, he adds something else. When he had been a professor for some time, he arrived in a town after a long train journey and got on to a bus. He then saw a man who was also boarding the bus from the other direction, and he thought, here's a down-at-heel schoolmaster getting on board. But then he saw that there was again a mirror on the other side, and he discovered that he had mentally referred to himself as a down-at-heel schoolmaster. He points out that he was more familiar with his generic type than his own particular form. Now, if it is already so difficult to recognize oneself with respect to one's outer appearance, It may perhaps be easier with women because they tend to look more often in the mirror. It is quite another thing when it comes to matters of the soul. There is not really another possibility for our present time of coming to know oneself than to sharpen our cognitive powers through what one can receive within spiritual science. The concepts and ideas that we receive through spiritual science are suited in the best sense for sharpening our self-knowledge. Everything that we may receive through the book titled An Outline of Occult Science, Readers Aside, also known as An Outline of Esoteric Science, and of Readers Aside, is fundamentally based upon self-knowledge in a universal sense. All the thoughts and ideas that we receive through this book really lead us to the point of coming to know ourselves, of knowing what man really is. As we study how the human physical body, etheric body, and astral body have come into being through Saturn Sun and Moon evolution, we come to know what is within us. And by coming to know what is within us in a universal sense, our powers of imagination are sharpened in order that we may know ourselves in a particular individual sense far better than is otherwise possible. To what extent does this self-knowledge have a significance for the moment of death? For as long as we dwell here in the physical body, self-knowledge is simply knowledge. 
But when we pass through the gate of death, all the self-knowledge that we have acquired is transformed into will forces. The better we know ourselves, the stronger will be this kind of will force when we have laid aside our physical body. Let us suppose, for example, that we have in our earthly life come to see that in certain respects we were a person with a violent temper. Well, you know how difficult it is wholly to transform ourselves in physical life and to overcome something like a violent temper, even if we are aware of it. But in the moment when we lay aside our physical body, the mere knowledge that we had a hot temper becomes a force of will, and this will is directed toward excluding violence from our being. Every judgment involving insight becomes a will judgment when we pass through the gate of death. It becomes a force of will. And then something very significant arises, which we can, in a certain sense, call the reversal of something that is experienced before a person's birth, but which is forgotten, because he is unable to look back to the period before his birth. But let us imagine that he could already now accomplish what he will develop in Jupiter existence, when he is gradually preparing out of the spiritual world to enter once more into an incarnation, he would, in a highly remarkable way, experience something like a perception of his future form, his future life. He would also behold something of his physical form. But there is one thing that he would never perceive in this physical form, which would appear to him as two points. Let us imagine that as we advance toward birth, we would have our physical form hovering before us as though in a mist. We would see it as light. But within it we would see dark, impenetrable points, dark spheres, also much else besides, but also these dark spheres. Long before a human individual advances toward his physical birth, he sees, as it were in time, not in space, before him, this is what you will be. And he sees in a certain sense how his physical organism is fashioned out of the essence of the spirits of form. This appears to him more or less as a figure of light, but hovering within it two dark spheres. When the person approaches physical life, this happens in part already in the body of the mother, he takes certain forces from these surroundings which the mother then forms. He gradually feels connected with this figure of light, and then he feels as if he were especially within these two spheres. Previously they seemed to him to be impenetrable, now he is within them, and then feels the forces that come toward him from all sides that enter into him. Then he pierces these two spheres, the space of the spheres, the space loses its impenetrability, and these are the spaces where the eyes will be. Thus when one is approaching physical earthly incarnation, what one does not immediately see is what enables us to see, namely the eyes. They are like impenetrable spheres that accompany our approach to life. Then one penetrates them in the last phase before one enters the physical world. If one were to experience this consciously, it would indeed be a wonderful phenomenon. Just think that as one makes one's way from the spiritual world to the physical world, one says to oneself, Now your soul is approaching this physical form. You will find there two dark spheres. You cannot look through them with your present soul vision. They are full of spiritual substance. Then one acquires the power to make what is spiritually impenetrable transparent. And when one then, as one says, perceives the light of the world, these spaces that were impenetrable to sight are the very reason why one sees. One cannot oneself see the eyes, or one to see them, one would not see the world. When one passes through the portal of death, the subsequent sight of death is also, therefore, such a wonderful phenomenon in the spiritual life of a human being after death, because something similar is happening with the whole human being, as occurred here with the eyes. Only what now occurs with the whole human being is experienced consciously. One must, after death, acquire the feeling in one's inner experience, 
you have departed from the world. Hitherto, one had in the I, E-Y-E, the physical world as a physical experience, that which the etheric body finally still shows as a tableau. Now one comes through the portal of death with what one has engendered by way of self-knowledge, and this becomes a power of will. Now imagine that here, referring to a drawing, and there is one, is a dead person. He leaves his physical experiences behind. He radiates his power of will, this power of will that he has acquired through self-knowledge. And this radiant power of will that he has acquired through self-knowledge clears away that which prevents us from perceiving our spiritual surroundings. Just as when we approach our birth we clear away the obscuring aspect of the I, so do we remove what prevents us from perceiving the spiritual world through this power of will. After death, we make ourselves transparent. This is the significant event. When someone passes through the gate of death, for as long as he still has his etheric body, he surveys the whole of his life as a mighty tableau. This stands before him. But he also has the feeling, you are seeing yourself. This is you as you were living between birth and death. This is all you were. Now there stirs within him all the power of self-knowledge that he has acquired, and it has the penetrating power that I have described, which enables the etheric body to depart. It is then as if a veil were to fall away, and what is behind comes for the first time to manifestation, and this is the spiritual world. It is an immense experience to go through the gate of death and to have the whole last life before one through the etheric body, having become free, and to receive the feeling. This last life is a veil that covers up a vast world that you were not able to see during life. Now the power of will, deriving from self-knowledge, battles against this veil and removes it, and when the veil is torn the spiritual world appears behind it. One does not need to have anxiety for the reason that someone might say, in our present time so many people have done absolutely nothing to arrive at a certain self-knowledge. According to the judgment of many people, one can hardly be cleverer and more intelligent than a contemporary university professor of philosophy. This is, after all, the ideal of intelligence at present. And yet one cannot be so little cut out for self-knowledge as a really famous man who is even a philosopher, Ernst Mach, who really is a person of some significance. Thus someone might become troubled and say that self-knowledge is in a poor state at present. Admittedly, if the situation were such that it would be indicated to people that they would only have the power of will deriving from the self-knowledge ensuing from their present life, things would look bad for them. Present-day people are very proud of the immense advances in knowledge that have been achieved, and from a certain aspect also rightly. Just think how a modern doctor who knows everything about current medical practice proudly looks down upon those who haven't been doctors for very long. They are all fools, he naturally thinks. With respect to outward knowledge, human beings have, over the course of recent centuries, achieved and come to know many things about the outer world, how external phenomena relate, and so on. In this sense, great advances have been made. But with respect to self-knowledge, the olden times when we were involved with former incarnations were far ahead of the present. So far, indeed, that a person of today, if he thinks materialistically, has absolutely no understanding of what derives from olden times. For what people today view as old prejudices was in that it was experienced by the souls of these former times basically self-knowledge. And what has been recorded are only the last remnants of self-knowledge. As regards earthly life, it is the case that someone with an ordinary sense-bound consciousness has no knowledge of his former incarnations. It is true that among the theosophists there are people who manage, after a relatively short time, to know terribly much about their former incarnations. 
In a European city, I once became acquainted with a society where Seneca, Frederick the Great, the Emperor Joseph, the Duke of Reichstadt, Madame Pompadour, Marie Antoinette, and certain others were sitting together at one coffee table. But apart from those who know so much about their former incarnations, after they have learned a little theosophy, people generally know not very much or nothing at all about their former incarnation through ordinary outward knowledge. For just as it is true that a person knows nothing of his previous incarnation through what the present cycle of human experience gives him, so is it equally true that he is dependent for his will development after death upon what has remained to him from former lives. Whereas between birth and death people know nothing of their former incarnations, in the life between death and a new birth they have all the forces of their previous incarnations within them and also that which is always lived through between death and a new birth. Thus when someone passes through the gate of death, he not only has that power of will that derives from the self-knowledge that people generally do not have today, but all the will forces that come not from the self-knowledge in this life, but from the self-knowledge that he has acquired in former lives. He is therefore not bereft of that power of will that clears away the fabric that has been woven through his own life. However, if in the course of the coming millennia a person wants to acquire new will forces, even this self-knowledge from olden times would become ever weaker, and this is why spiritual science is needed for the further evolution of mankind. For such is the course of human evolution, that the power of human will is still sufficient for today. But the time is now beginning when this power of will can be strengthened through man's coming to know the spiritual world during earthly development. The earthly evolution of mankind would be exposed to a danger if people were to resist in every respect receiving something from spiritual science from now onward until the end of earthly evolution. They would then increasingly come to the point of being little able to perceive anything of spiritual phenomena and happenings in the world of spirit. This would be ever less and less possible for them. They would have increasing difficulty in penetrating the veil of which I spoke. You see, therefore, what significant self-knowledge transformed into a power of will, has. Here this knowledge is self-perception, there it is self-will, which is directed toward removing the veil from the spiritual world. Especially in those who pass through the portal of death, one perceives how important it is for them that they are strengthened in their power of will as it has now been characterized in the power of will that derives from self-knowledge. It is therefore really meaningful that when a person passes through the portal of death, he concerns himself through these various stages with what is within him, with what is within his self, with what he was during his earthly life. And if someone has communion with a dead person, it is of great essential significance to make this communion especially fruitful by helping the person who has thus departed in strengthening his self-awareness in the fulfillment of this self-awareness. This is meant in a very real sense. Let us think of someone who was with us here in physical life and who has passed through the portal of death. As we have lived with him, we know how he was. We know what he particularly liked doing and so on. When he has passed through the portal of death, it is necessary, urgently necessary for him, as it were, to summon up everything that he wills through strong inner forces. And this must flow from his review of his life. We can help him in this if we think of him in such a way as he appeared to us in life, if we endeavor to send him thoughts that characterize him as he was. In addition to the various things that have been said about our concern with the dead who have departed from us, we can also make our help available to them by bringing them a kind of picture of their essential being. In this way we relieve them of some of the effort in the unfolding of that will which needs to tear away the veil that has been characterized. It therefore happened 
that the situation of which I spoke to you the day before yesterday arose for me. Thus, when I had to speak recently at the funeral of friends, I felt myself confronted with the need to express at the funeral itself what lives in these friends as regards their essential nature. What I had said was spoken not out of memories, but emerged from my own soul in such a way that this soul of mine put itself wholly into the other soul after it had crossed the threshold of death. When one has to do with the soul that has crossed the threshold of death, it is a matter of putting oneself in the place of this soul. Here in the physical world, one is directly confronted by the object, one beholds it from without. In the spirit realm, one is with one's whole being within this soul spiritual essence. And so it was that in the particular case of which I spoke the day before yesterday, it was possible for me to put myself into the soul of this person who had passed through the portal of death and who has been characterized by me as someone who had for many years before her death greatly concerned herself with this world conception of ours, so that for as long as she was still within her etheric body, she was, through her, having immersed herself in spiritual science and having received certain forces, able to express in words something of her own essence, what she was as a being. I managed to catch these words from the dead person who had passed through the portal of death, and I had to speak them at her funeral. In other cases it was different. When I had to speak at the funeral of our dear Fritz Mitcher, who must be remembered with particular fondness by the members of our branch, the situation was that I felt the need fully to put myself within this soul who had gone through the gate of death. But now the need arose to put in words what this soul was in life for those who had befriended it and were around it also as members of our anthroposophical movement, in order, together with this soul, after its death, to ponder and share in all that self-knowledge had contributed to encouraging the development of its will. It then became necessary to say things at this funeral that were in harmony with what our dead friend Fritz Mitcher experienced in the times of his development after he had joined forces with our spiritual scientific movement, what he had assimilated, how his inner karma had led him. And the words that I had to speak are, as I said, not my words. They emanated from the forces of his own soul, but formed in such a way that they expressed the essence of the years which had preceded his death. This is what I had to say. It was not a case of wanting to say what I myself had to say. They were, of course, not directly his own words. The soul in question would never have said this out of itself in life. It is what the other soul has felt, a soul that is linked with the soul of the one who has departed, as can be sensed only in the case of a soul that is already disembodied. I would like to share with you these words, that I had to speak at the funeral, quote, As a hope that gladdens us, so do we venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. Your longing had its deep affinity with a pure love of truth. The goal to which you tirelessly aspired throughout your life was creation from the spirit light. You cultivated your fine gifts to follow with sure step the radiant path of spirit knowledge, unswayed by outward opposition, as a true servant of the truth. Your spirit organs you enhanced, that they boldly and persistently thrust error from you to both sides of the path and create for you a realm for truth. To fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun-power of the soul might radiate its strength within you was your concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched your soul, for knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for you life's truest worth. As a hope that gladdens us, so do we venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, 
manifest themselves to the questing spirit, a loss that deeply us aggrieves. So do you venture from the field, where earthly seeds of spirit have matured for your senses' spheres in the womb of soul-being. Feel how we look lovingly up to the heights that called you now away for other creating. Extend your strength from realms of spirit to the friends you've left behind. Hear the entreaty of our souls, sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. As a hope that gladdens us, a loss that deeply us grieves, let us hope that from far and near, unforsaken for our life, you shine as starry soul in spirit realms. Close quote. Although these words should not be regarded as having been spoken by the soul itself, they were nevertheless spoken in such community with it that after a relatively short time something was manifested from this soul that now came from it alone, thus not from my soul but only from the soul that had gone through the gate of death. And this then sounded forth, and since that time these words have repeatedly resounded to me, quote, to fashion myself, that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul, for knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Close quote. And when for the first time, it has often happened since, I heard these words from this soul that had passed through death, it occurred to me, for what I have read out was indeed written down word for word as I heard it in connection with this soul, that a dialogue could arise. At the cremation, the words spoken were, quote, to fashion yourself that it revealed the purity of light, close quote. In these verses, the second person is used. But this was not my doing. I only noticed when the words came back from the dead soul that these words were formed in such a way that they were given back in the first person, quote, to fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, close quote. You see there a dialogue, a kind of mutual understanding extending beyond the grave. In connection with this, I should like to speak of something that is often mentioned in our spiritual scientific movement, but which cannot be spoken of enough. In the verses that were addressed to a soul that had passed through the portal of death, you find that something resounds, which comes particularly to expression, where it is said, quote, Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. Close quote. Do not regard such a plea as mere words. This speaks of something that is in the deepest sense significantly connected with the whole nature of our spiritual scientific movement. When a soul has endeavored, as has the one in question, to imbue all the knowledge and experiences that it has assimilated with spiritual scientific impulses, and it goes prematurely through the gate of death, it is indeed the case that such a soul can continue to be a faithful collaborator. Thus, when I spoke these words for this soul, it was something of the nature of a plea, that it may become a helper for what must be our will to accomplish for the future of the earth. For you can regard it as an absolute certainty that the gulf between the living and the dead must be livingly spanned through our spiritual science over the course of earthly evolution. We must learn to regard the dead not as people who are dead, but as those who live and act creatively among us, just as we live together with those who live in a physical body. Those who are the so-called dead will then work with us with those forces that are available to them. We must try to understand in a living way and not as a theory the impulses that spiritual science 
would have us translate into the living life that we want to contribute out of the future to cultural development. And it must truly be said that if one takes account of the present circumstances of our outward culture, the help of those in the spiritual world will be needed in the future. Those who truly provide access here on earth to the spiritual scientific movement will need the souls of the dead. Hence it was said that for earthly work we need the strength from the lands of spirit that we owe to dead friends. It is a plea that these souls that are working further with the forces which have been strengthened by what they have received here and imbued with what they have received in spirit lands may work together with us on earth, that they be imbued with that which is of the same nature as what we will. There are so many symptoms of the considerable difficulties and hindrances that confront what we refer to as our earthly anthroposophical task. Among many others that can be observed, one may now be cited. Some years ago an article appeared in a South German journal that created a sensation, because it was made known that its author was a leading philosopher. The editor of the journal was called Karl Muth. This Karl Muth had at the time accepted a lengthy article when my book titled Occult Science appeared. He published this article in connection with the book. It would not perhaps have been particularly difficult for me to repudiate, at any rate, the most hostile aspects of the article and its most foolish assertions. For the truth about that great philosopher is, while for many he is indeed a great philosopher, there are many others who have encountered him in life. He does not need to have come particularly close to them or to have sat opposite to them, to whom he appears as a kind of burr that sticks to them. This is also how he appeared to me, and I have had to keep myself away from him. But after he had written postcard after postcard, letter after letter to me, he also sent me this article in manuscript form. I could not bring myself to read the article, because it began in such a silly way. Thus he says, for example, that Steiner calls what he has written in his book Occult Science. But there cannot be such a thing as an occult science, for it is the essential nature of science that it is not occult but public. Thus an occult science contradicts the nature of science itself. This is how the article began. And as I skimmed through it, I came upon such shameless nonsense that it was totally beyond me to read the manuscript any further. It is still lying around somewhere. It is ridiculous to say such a thing about occult science, for one merely needs to have some knowledge of German to sense how silly it is. It is just as though someone were to say, no science is natural, but there is natural science. It is true that there is no science that is secret, but there is an occult science. It was therefore too silly for words, but the editor of the journal found that it was a particularly significant article. The article has been much read and what he said about occult science, where he subjected it to thorough criticism, was considered to be very clever. Now the war came. The philosopher is no German, and he now considers himself to be among the most hostile enemies of Germany. He now writes a series of letters to the same Karl Muth, who at the time, please forgive the hackneyed expression, had licked his lips at the thought of having received the article from the famous philosopher. Such venom and poison has been disseminated about Germany and the German people, but nothing has been written that is as awful as what this famous philosopher wrote in his letters to Karl Muth. His judgments and criticisms about Germany and the German nature are of the most atrocious kind. What then ensued can even be regarded as a good sign. After spitting out this venom and poison, the philosopher in question wrote, unfortunately not with, in quotes, secret science, because the censor did not prevent him from overstepping the mark, so that it even arrived in Munich, and Muth found the courage to print more of it. But now not in order to publish the significant article of a significant man, but some years later the same Karl Muth prints these writings about Germany and writes, of course, a man who writes like this must be someone who belongs in a madhouse. You see, for Karl Muth, these writings about the German nature 
were necessary in order to make him realize that the man is a fool. A few years ago he let the same fool loose on our spiritual science. A sensible person could have known this already, but fools are also often reckoned to be famous philosophers, and this should not trouble anyone. But you see from this what dangers spiritual science is exposed to. Had the war not come and Karamut had not been taught that the good man, this Professor Vincenti Ludoslavsky, is actually a fool, he would have had occasion to accept another article from the pen of this famous philosopher seeking to destroy spiritual science. You also see from this that in our time people are often not inclined to determine through their power of judgment what standpoint they should adopt towards spiritual science. I only mention this in order to show by means of an example, and one could cite many such examples, what hindrances our spiritual scientific movement is exposed to, that even those who are later necessarily regarded as fools are let loose upon it. It may perhaps also be justified to point out that much else that is said against this same spiritual science is not much cleverer than this. For where something is demonstrated in a really striking way, there must surely be some truth in it. We must make it clear to ourselves that in order to make spiritual scientific impulses truly alive, we also need the forces of those who have gone through the gate of death and who, before they crossed this threshold, have received what is embraced within the light of spiritual science. The gulf between the living and the dead must above all else first be removed in the domain of our spiritual science itself. This must therefore be our constant watchword to keep alive the awareness that we had of the souls who were close to us while they were living among us in a physical body, holy as they were then, though oriented toward a different form of life. This is something that we want to do, even if the souls in question have passed through the gate of death. One of the most beautiful and significant things that we can achieve out of spiritual science is that we are able to regard those who have passed through the gate of death as people who live among us and give us blessings, just as we meet with those who are living in a physical body. And this will find some essential support to the fact that on the battlefields, where something new is being prepared out of blood and death, so many souls are now passing at an early point in their physical life through the portal of death and making available unspent etheric bodies to the spiritual world. Man's etheric body is prepared in such a way that it can supply a person with life forces until old age. If someone passes through the portal of death when he is still young, the forces that could still have been used if he had reached old age are unspent. And we can now look up into the etheric realm of the spiritual world, where such a person still remains for a time once he has left the physical plane. From those who have fallen on the fields where battles are being waged, and who have passed through the gate of death, there are many youthful etheric bodies that do not immediately dissolve, but continue to hold together and contain forces that could have sustained life for a long time. These etheric bodies will be forces that are able to help human beings when they look up longingly with the consciousness of spiritual science to where what is contained in unspent etheric bodies will reside. Those forces from above will join with those who wish consciously to unite themselves with these forces out of a spiritual scientific consciousness. As we feel and sense this, we may direct our attention to them. We may commit ourselves to the spiritual world in a living way. We may say to ourselves that there must in the future in the time that will follow this war, be people here on this earth of ours who have within them souls that are able to look up into the spiritual world in such a way that these unspent etheric bodies will be realities for them. That through knowledge of the spiritual world this becomes a reality for them. Then spiritual science will show that it has grown beyond mere knowledge to real life a life that, moreover, has its reality through the destiny-laden events of our time. 
one will then be able to say that because there will be souls in the world that look up to the etheric bodies in yonder world that develop their unspent forces, those human souls on the earth will be able to receive these forces and will be able to work with ever greater strength. And the forces of these unspent etheric bodies of those who have made their sacrifices on the fields of blood and death will be fruitful for earthly souls in the future. For this reason, we wish also today to be mindful of the collaboration that can arise between souls that pervaded in the soul's spiritual sense by spiritual scientific knowledge will in future look up to what remains of the etheric bodies from this war, to what can arise from this inner soul collaboration. We wish also today to inscribe in our souls those words that I have been speaking at the end of the studies conducted in our branches out of the whole context of the events of our time. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. That is the end of Lecture 15 and the end of the book, The Mystery of Death, Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner.